Let me take you to an urban slum in the North Indian city of Chandigarh. Here, water buffaloes and chickens are looking for their grain of life. Pools of stagnant water act as breeding ground for mosquitoes. I cross one such open sewage and enter the residential area of the slum. Step into a small room. This room houses 25 kids between the ages of three and six years and is staffed by a worker called the Anganwari worker. This daycare center is called an Anganwari. Even though there are alphabet charts on walls, there is no lighting. The temperature is over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but there are no ceiling fans. I take a picture of these kids and show it to them. Many of them haven't seen themselves on a camera before. I weigh all these kids who are present at the center and find that almost half of them are malnourished. This Anganwadi in Chandigarh is not unique. All around the world, three million children die every year because they are malnourished. That's about four times the size of Boston. Half of all child mortality happens directly because of undernutrition. Even though there has been steep declines in undernutrition from 1980 to 2015, the global uh, malnutrition rate, for instance, has dropped from 40% to about 23%. Much remains to be done. India is a clear outlier. On the x-axis here, you see malnutrition rates. And on the y-axis, is the per capita income. Each bubble here represents a country, and the size of the bubble is the population. As you can see, India has higher malnutrition than Ethiopia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Liberia, and even though the per capita income is the same as Ghana, the malnutrition is three times as high. What is the reason that despite being one of the fastest growing economies in the last 20 years, India's malnutrition has been declining only very slowly? Has the income not trickled down to the poor? That doesn't seem to be the case. The poor are increasing in their incomes. So what could be the reason behind high malnutrition in India and more or less a stagnant rate of undernutrition. India is home to over a third of the world's stunted children and 1.27 million children approximately die every year in India because of malnutrition. I ask the Anganwari worker why it is that almost half the class is malnourished. She blames the mother. She says that the mothers lack the knowledge on what to feed the child. They, they, they don't feed the right amount of calories and protein. Now, an Anganwari worker herself can affect the health of a child through two main channels. She's supposed to provide a midday meal to the kids, one, the porridge bowl, as you can see, um, so she's supposed to distribute this amongst her kids in the class. And the other channel through which she can change the health of the child is by talking to mothers and guiding them on nutrition and health behavior. So the worker blames the mother. I go further into the slums and interview a mother and ask her why she thinks her child is malnourished. The mother 
blames the state. Anganwadi is part of uh, the Integrated Child Development Services, which was set up by the government of India in 1975. It's the world's largest child care program. It encompasses over 1.3 million daycare centers, and each center is staffed by only one worker. So there are 1.3 million workers in India trying to improve the health of children. These workers are paid very meager wages. Their wages are about $50 a month, which is about a tenth of what a government assistant would earn in, in, uh, in the same region. So she blames a lack of worker effort. The worker doesn't teach me what I should cook. The worker doesn't show me that my child is undernourished. The worker doesn't show me the growth chart that she's supposed to show, and many a time she's even absent. So here was a problem. The supply side was blaming the demand side, and the demand side was blaming the supply side. What could be done? So we designed an experiment in the city of Chandigarh in 2010. And, uh, and there were three components to this experiment. The first component was a recipe book. This was done to address the lack of maternal knowledge, so to speak. In the 2005-06 Demographic and Health Survey, for instance, nine out of 10 mothers don't increase the fluid intake in their children when their ch child has diarrhea. This is against the recommendation of the World Health Organization. So we designed a recipe book in collaboration with the local food and nutrition board that contained 10 simple, easy to make, nutritious, delicious, calorific recipes. All of them contained local ingredients. And we said that, what if we just give this to the mothers? This would solve the maternal knowledge problem, hopefully, and that could improve the health of the kids. Now, remember that the mother had blamed the state, so we had to also think about ways to motivate the worker. And when we had spoken with the workers, workers were, obviously, they, they were not satisfied with their wages. They wanted their wages to go up for the amount of work that they were putting in. So we thought of an incentive scheme wherein the worker would get a performance-based bonus, and the performance would be based on the decline in malnutrition that would happen in her center. So she would get $3 for every child that improved a grade of malnutrition. So if a child went from severely malnourished to moderately malnourished, that's one grade improvement. Or from moderate to mild, that's another grade improvement. So the worker would get $3 for nutritional grade improvements, and then we'd also subtract from the total bonus if there were kids who declined in their nutritional status. So for instance, if three kids went up and one kid went down, then the total payout to the worker would be $6. 4,101 children were weighed twice during the course of this experiment in 2010 in the city of Chandigarh that I just showed you. There were three treatment arms. The first treatment was the recipe group treatment, where uh, about 900 mothers got a recipe book. In the incentive treatment, which was the second treatment and the bonus treatment for the worker, there were 1,061 children and 38 workers. In the combined treatment, again, there were close to 1,000 children, and the combined treatment, the mothers got the recipe books and the workers got the incentives. The intuition behind the combined treatment was that it takes two to tango. <laughs> Perhaps you need both the mother and the worker to reduce undernutrition and not one or the other. In economics, this is called complementarity. 
So to test for complementarity, we had to test whether the effect of the combined treatment was greater than the sum of the effects of the recipe treatment and the incentive treatment. And we can statistically test for that. The fourth group was the control group, where we just follow the kids over time and see how they grow. And what we found was very insightful, because the recipe treatment had no significant effect. The incentive scheme alone had no effect. And these were precisely estimated zero effects. But the combined treatment actually led to a significant drop in malnutrition, which was about four percentage points over a quarter. Once we discontinued the incentive scheme and weighed these kids a year later, they had the, the gains that they had accumulated initially, those gains had persisted over a year. Then we delved into why this happened. What were the mechanisms driving this increase in weight for age and also uh, a decline in um, the malnutrition? A team of enumerators had not only weighed these kids, but they had gone to the mothers and interviewed them both before the treatment and after the treatment at end line. What we found was that workers had started making more home visits when they were incentivized. And when they went to the homes, they gave specific nutritional advice to the mothers when the mothers had recipe books. So the communication was much more effective when the mothers had the recipe books at home and the workers, when the workers were incentivized. So this communication effectiveness actually drove the complementarity in improvement, in improvement of weights. In turn, we also asked mothers about the diet that they were giving to their kids. And we found that mothers improved caloric and protein intake in their children. That experiment was carried out in 2010. Since then, I've carried out a similar experiment in Kolkata among 209 daycare centers. And again in Chandigarh in 2014-15, um, in 165 daycare centers. In both of these experiments, we have been able to corroborate a decline in malnutrition of roughly the same magnitude every quarter where workers got performance-based pay and mothers got information. So this has been replicated over and over again. What we've also found is that just increasing the wage without conditioning it on the weight gain of the kids is not as effective. So just increasing the wages as a fixed lump sum amount is not as effective. We found that making Workers compete against one another is not as effective as just giving them this piecemeal incentive. You might think that after giving it once, if you, give it, if you implement this incentive scheme again, it would have no effect, but a renewal of incentives also leads to a decline in malnutrition of about four percentage points. Finally, withdrawal of incentives did not crowd out intrinsic motivation of workers. It did not reverse the gains. That the, that the children had accumulated when the incentives were in place. And the main channel that was driving this was mother-worker communication, and we, in a recent uh, paper, I also find that worker attendance went up. So um, enumerators went in randomly and saw uh, whether the workers were present in their classroom or not, and they, they were more likely to be present when they were incentivized. Now, different contexts, will involve different strategies. What we can do is try and experiment. And sometimes experiments are going to be successful. And when they are successful, in the realm of early childhood nutrition, the benefit-cost ratios can be really, really high. So think about what happens when a child is no longer undernourished. Not only is that child less likely to die because of diseases such as diarrhea and pneumonia, but that child 
is also more likely to come to school. The child is more likely to have higher grades in school, to get more schooling, to have higher labor productivity, and eventually higher wages. Economists can back out the lifetime increase in wages and say that's the benefit of not being undernourished. The benefit-cost ratio estimate of the combined treatment was close to 16, which means that if you spend a dollar today on implementing the combined treatment over a long enough period, you're actually going to get $16 back. So it's in the interests of governments and NGOs and communities to actually implement policies that have high benefit-cost ratios. Finally, improvement in child health is just the first step towards kids realizing their potential and leading fulfilling lives. Thank you.